Hebrews 13, and we're going to do uh, verse 7 and 8. Now, last week we looked at uh, 1 through 3 and 15 and 16. We talked about caring for the poor. The week before that, we talked about the marriage bed is to be held in honor by all. And then the, the, the next verse actually should be, uh, make sure your character is free from the love of money. But I knew that no one has the love of money in this church, so I, I thought, why bother? And I just thought, let's skip on down to and verse 7, you know. Now, I'll pick it up another time, I'm sure. But it just, this is what I felt led to talk about today. And uh, so, Father God, would you open the Word of God to us and our hearts to the Word of God? Lord, we, we love your word. We are so grateful we have it. And we want to understand, we want to obey, that we might live and be blessed and please you. So come now and open your word to all of us. Grace me to speak so it's your voice we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, he says this. <clears throat> Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. And then he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Would you say verse 8 with me? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Let me start with our, with our uh, discussion guide. This letter was apparently written during the mid to late A.D. 60s just before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which was in 70 AD. If that had happened, you can, you can bet he would have referred to it. So most of the original disciples of Jesus had already gone to be with the Lord. Yet there must have been many believers scattered throughout the churches who still remembered them and may even have been converted by their preaching. So when the author says, remember those who led you, he almost certainly meant the apostolic leaders of the early church. In fact, he already pointed to them in chapter 2, verse 3, when he reminded his readers that after the gospel they had received was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. In other words, Jesus taught the gospel to his disciples, and they taught it to us. Then in the next verse, that is Hebrews 2, 4, he goes on to say, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, meaning many of us saw with our own eyes God confirm what they preached by doing miracles and sending the gifts of the Spirit. He wants his readers to recognize the spiritual impact made by those apostolic lives. The way they lived and ministered produced great results and therefore should be looked to as a model for later generations. He says, imitate their faith which means pattern your own lives after theirs. Their faith made them bold and caused them to move in the power of the Holy Spirit and made them willing to suffer and die for Christ. Now let's look back at Hebrews 7 and 8, uh, 13, verse 7 and 8. I'm going to put them in my own words. Here's, here's what I think these verses mean. Verse 7, he says, Remember the apostles who first preached the word of God to us, Look at the results that came from the way they lived and ministered and imitate their faith. Would you say imitate their faith? Imitate. And that, that's the word he uses, the Greek word. It means imitate, mimic, be like them. Verse 8, and don't say to yourselves, we can't expect to move in the power of the Spirit as they did. Those things took place over 35 years ago. That was what they would have said. You most certainly can, because Jesus Christ is the source of that power, and he doesn't change. What he did while he was on earth yesterday is what he's willing to do now, today, and will continue to make available until he comes again. He says literally, unto the ages. Why did he need to say this? Time erodes human will and emotion. Have you noticed? You can have a great commitment. You can have a great, great time with God. You can be on fire. But something about the passing of time, just being faithful, being diligent over time, erodes our will and our emotion. We become distracted by competing interests. We grow weary. But the struggle is not simply inside us. We face an enemy 
who aggressively attacks individuals, churches, and movements using temptation, division, and doctrinal confusion. So revival always has to be revived. Revival always has to be revived. You see that? There's always a need to be restirring and, and refreshing or we decline. It wanes over time. Obviously, between 32 and 68 AD, the date I think Hebrews was written, you'll know why if you've read your daily Bible study, this erosion had taken place at least in this group of churches, which you'll also know what group that is if you've read your daily Bible study. So the author challenges them to remember what it was like in the early years after Pentecost and tells them to stir up the life of the Spirit that had once been theirs. Let's have a look and see what he's talking about. He says, I want you to be like the apostles. Remember them? And these guys did, many of them. The, well, I'll, I'll tell you. I think the churches he's writing to, and you'll see why if you have read your Bible study, and I'll probably say it later, is around Rome. Paul didn't found the church in Rome. That thing probably started back with Pentecost. There were undoubtedly believers from Rome in that area of Italy back then. So it's an old church. It's a church that started right there in the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost. You know, I think Barnabas wrote this book. Barnabas was there either at Pentecost or very shortly thereafter. He is described in chapter 4 already as being a very dedicated part of the life of that church. He's... He's saying, you all remember, you, some of you saw Peter and John. You knew Philip. You saw the power of God through those brothers. And he says, remember how it was. And he says, you need to walk like they walked. Now think of that. That's quite the challenge, isn't it? Be like the apostles. We often want to put them on a pedestal. We want to say, well, those guys are special. <laughs> I mean, they got churches named after them. You can't expect me to do that. Well, let's see by the time we're done here. Put them on a pedestal. He says, no. Don't think that way. And don't think that just because there's been 35 years that have passed, that God's out of business. Amen. That that was for, the, for the, those days. You and I today would have to say, it's been 2,000 years. And he says, don't think that way. Because Jesus Christ is in business. He is the same. What he does yesterday when he was here walking with his disciples, what we see in the book of Acts is the same yesterday then. Today, it's immediately available now. And it will be until he comes again unto the ages, to the messianic age, when everything only ramps higher, not lower. So he says, you get it in your head that what you've seen in their lives is potential available for us now. Let's have a look at what it was like. Go with me to Acts chapter 3. We're gonna, I'm just picking a sample. And let's have a look at what that early group of apostles was like. I'll start at verse 1. I'm going to just kind of go through it rapidly and analyze it and then just keep moving. Just give you a sense, a taste of this whole thing. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour. What time is that? It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Why are they going up to the temple at the ninth hour? It's the hour of prayer. What's going to happen at the temple? Just, just an interesting point. It is the evening sacrifice. What time did Jesus die? Three o'clock in the afternoon. What did we say? That's the moment when the shofar is blown, the lamb is slain, and it's time for evening prayer. They are going up at that same hour to the temple. And a man, verse 2, who had been lame from his mother's womb, was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. 
Notice he's being carried along. It's almost like Peter and John are walking toward the temple and someone's carrying him. It's not even there yet. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. He reaches out his hand, looks at him, it's kind of like alms for the poor. Ministry, would you notice, please, happened during the normal course of daily events. Peter and John are not out trolling for bodies. <laughs> They're just going to worship. And they see this guy. Now, there's lots of beggars. They see this guy. Look at verse 4. Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him. See that? He fixed his gaze on him. He's staring at him and said, look at us. Look me in the eyes. I mean, this is kind of intense. And he began to give them his attention, expecting, okay, these guys are going to give me some money to receive from something from them. Peter discerned the will of the Lord for this man, though the man himself was not spiritually expectant. You don't see any faith in this guy at all, right? That ought to do something to some of this thing where you're always blaming people who don't get healed because they don't have enough faith. This guy's an absolute nerd, Dull as a post. He simply wants some money, okay? He's just... But Peter is being led by the Holy Spirit. And Peter's seeing something else. Everything's going on Peter's side of this equation. As he fixed his gaze on him, he was receiving guidance as to what to do. He's looking at him and he's staring and he, what he's doing, well, the reason he's fixing he's, and he's fixated on him is he's, he's going through more than just looking at the man. He's seeing what the Lord wants to do. Years ago, a friend of mine uh, was preaching on a, on, a, on a situation with his father. He, he was a pastor and his dad was actually our supervisor. And he, and he, he, he said, you know, we were, I was up with my dad at our camp, which our, our camp, we still have one, is in Oregon. It's no longer for our area, but it, then it was. And, and uh, he was up with his dad. They were looking at things at the camp. And his father was talking to the head custodian, just standing outside on the sidewalk. And they got done, and he was kind of waiting for him. And then he and his dad were walking down the sidewalk, walking away, and his father just stopped right in mid-step, turned around, reached in, took his wallet out of his pocket, went back, handed the guy some money, turned around, and started walking again with his son. And his son says, stop everything. Don't move. What just happened? And his dad said simply, I've learned over the years that when I see myself doing something, I ought to do it. Now, you test it, of course. Well, what, have you, how many know what that experience is? You see yourself doing something. It's, it's, it's like a, 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 just a, a momentary daydream. It goes by, suddenly there it is. It's just a picture in the mind. When I see myself doing something, I ought to do it. He had obviously been walking away, saw, him, saw himself giving that man some money. The Lord is telling him, the man needs something, go give it to him. And he just obeyed. Would you please notice... There's no program for that. There's no checklist for that. It's intuitive. Say intuitive. It's being led by the Spirit. I want, I want you to see what these apostles were like. If we're going to imitate their faith, there's a point where I've got to be listening and in a communicative role with the Holy Spirit. I've got to be able to hear him and understand it's him when he's guiding me. Peter fixes his gaze on this guy and begins to change the whole equation. Now down to verse 6. He, he began to, he wants, he's asking something from them, and Peter says, I don't possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Peter had a gift of faith. He says, I don't have money, but I do sense the power and the will of God. Peter, didn't, Peter and John, would you please notice, didn't pray for the man. That would have been an entirely different picture. They stop and just say, stop, whoever's carrying this. Just a minute now. We just want to pray for this brother. And they lay hands. Oh, God. He's been, he's been crippled for four, 40 years. All his life, poor guy. Heal him, Jesus. Oh, he, don't let him be like this anymore. 
It's a very different story. He didn't pray for him. What did he do? He, he, he spoke a word of command like he already knew the will of God. God, if it be thy will. He didn't go there. He'd already deciphered that it was. Peter and John didn't pray for the man. They spoke a command with authority. Where on earth did they learn to do that? You bet it was Jesus. He had not only told them these things, he had rehearsed them in it. They'd watched him, and he never did anything twice the same way, hardly. He's either, I mean, he's, his ways of healing was just all over the map. And then he sent them out, remember, two by two? One point with the 70, they go out, they come back, and they said, man, even, the, they've been out healing, they've been out casting out demons, and then they're getting debriefed by their leader. This is not an accident that they know how to do this. He has taught them how. He has debriefed them to see if they're getting it. They watched him. They're doing it. They're being debriefed. They're being trained. They're not just accidentally or being presumptuous. They were, in, they were developed to be able to do this. What made him believe that he could do what Jesus did? Well, I mean, where do we start? Greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father and he'll send the Holy Spirit. That'd be one. I, you know, I, I give you authority. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed. As the Father sent me, so send I you. I mean, shall we just go down the list of times he said, wait in the city, don't go anywhere till you be endued with power from on high and then you'll be my witnesses. And then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Verse 7, and seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. Peter saw himself raising the man by the hand. He had a word of knowledge. He saw something, and please notice his example isn't a formula to follow in every healing. You don't heal everybody by grabbing them by the hand and raising them up. You did in this case. You do if that's what the Lord shows you in that specific case. We have to be very careful. Peter had watched Jesus heal in many different ways. I mean, if you want to make a formula, how about spitting in the mud? You know, spitting down in the dust, grabbing this gooey thing, rubbing it all together and sticking it on the guy, on his eyes. Now, that's a, that's a formula. We could form the Mud Stickers Association, and, <laughs> and every time somebody's ill, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wonk, how do you feel? We can make a formula out of that one, but I've never heard anybody do that. <laughs> they didn't do healing by a formula. They were led by the Spirit on a case-by-case, -case, even moment-by-moment -moment basis. If we're going to imitate the apostles, we've got to be listening and be able to hear and respond. Healing took a place as Peter raised him up, so Peter did take a risk. There's always that moment where he says, I'm gonna, he grabs him by the hand, and he could have looked very foolish. Verse 8. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Healing was instantaneous in this case. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it is not. We encourage people to receive ministry repeatedly, to contend for their healing over time. This greatly, we find, increases the percentage of those healed. This is a very dramatic one. That's why Luke wrote it. It's, it's remarkable. All healings don't come instantaneously like this. Some do, however. We had one, they were just, uh, we had kind of interesting evening last night in both services. Um, first service, David Norcross shared that Thursday night, you had a woman whose who's vertebra, uh, they x-rayed it, and there was nothing between the bones. There was, there was just three of them stacked. She was in pain and, 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 and becoming really quite frightened about the whole situation. She had had this x-ray, bad news, came in. They prayed for her, and as, even as they did, the pain lifted. Or she went home. I don't remember what happened, but it began, she really, the, the pain went away. Well, the doctor called the next day, wanted an MRI done. She said, I don't need it. I feel fine. She, he said, 
come, you need it, come in. And so she went in, had the MRI, and the doctor called back a few hours after when he finally had seen all everything, and he says, I, I don't know how to explain it, but the, the X-ray and the MRI are not the same at all. And there's no cartilage there. That's remarkable. Uh, we're going to try it. David wants to get a copy of that MRI. We're going to see if we can get it. That, God is still in business. He's, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's, that was this week, I think. That was Thursday night. So, I mean, and we have those kinds of healings. Does everybody get healed instantly? They do not. Do we still see that? Absolutely. And we learn to contend for healing and pray for healing and stand for healing and see the percentages of those healed go way up. You don't just, you don't just dabble at it. Look at verses 10 through 12, or 10 and on. They were taking note of him as the one be, who, who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, uh, full of amazement. The, the Temple Mount today, I, th I think they said it was 35 acres of stone. I mean, it's a huge area up there, and it was not much smaller then. And so in that sunshine and on that, on that stone, they had around the edges a uh, uh, colonnaded covering so you can get out of the sun. That's the portico of Solomon. And when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety, our holiness, our goodness, we had made him walk? The, mo the miracle created an opportunity for the preaching of the gospel. See that? The early church did not simply recite a gospel message and try to argue to convince people it's true. They didn't preach the gospel and then, then, then go through all sorts of apologetic arguments to show that there was a God and that all of these kinds of things. I'm not against that kind of thing, but please note that's not the way it's operating here. What is happening? They often started with a miracle that they and then explained that they didn't do the miracle, but God did because of Jesus Christ. The credibility of these apostles is pretty high right about there. This guy's 40 years old. He's been crippled since his birth. He's, been, he's a regular fixture as a beggar at the gate. Everybody knows him. The whole city knows him. Everybody goes to the temple. We all know this guy. And he's jumping around like an antelope. Praising God, you have to explain this somehow. So when they begin to say, can we tell you why? Everybody's listening. Please notice how they worked. The power of God opening the opportunity for the gospel. The gospel gives, uh, was given huge credibility by the indisputable fact that a work of spiritual power had taken place. Verse 16, he, so they're preaching all of this. I, I just, I won't take time, but Peter just, oh, he's so judgmental. I love it. Um, this man is a real preacher. He tells him, you are the, you, the, the, the God of, I will read it. God, verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate, you rats. When he had decided to release him, he had decided to release him, and you made him crucified. You disowned the holy and the righteous one, and as for a murderer to be granted to you, he is not letting them off the hook but put to death the prince of life, the one for whom God raised from the dead, and on the basis of faith in his name. It's the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all, and there's no debating what just happened. People, I think right now, we are in a time where there's a tremendous assault in, in Western Europe and in the United States on the Bible, on Jesus Christ. It's, it's just getting hammered. And if all we have to do is to rely on apologetics, defending our faith through philosophical logic, which frankly is pretty strong, you, you can get there from here. 
But if all we do is appeal to people's minds, hoping to convince them it must be true, and so that they make a commitment because of what their minds are convinced, we are at least not imitating the apostles. I mean, read the whole book of Acts. I'm picking one example. Read more. And you'll, you'll see that over and over again, there was the leading and the working and the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that today's America needs to see... I, Needs, I'm not, and I'm not inviting some kind of foolishness, but people led by the power of God, moving in, in, in faith, responding to what the Lord says, and allowing him to do his wonders. We need to see it. I don't know why this comes to mind. I haven't thought of this in years. years ago, uh, this was years ago. I had to even pull this thing up. All right, we had... I had a word of knowledge. It was another church, I, uh, and we were meeting in a high school. And I and I had a I, I I'm, I'm speaking, and I suddenly have this word of knowledge. I see skin problems, and and I, no, it was a rash on the neck. I saw a neck, and I saw a rash, and I just said, um, and I remember asking, does anybody have a rash on their neck? I I feel like the Lord wants to heal it right now. You know, you know me. I don't do this a lot. I didn't then, but I had it. And no one raised their hands, so I felt really good about myself right about then. <laughs> but I knew I wasn't faking it. I, was, I didn't invent this thing. I wasn't playing a game trying to get some kind of credibility. I saw this, so I said, you know, I'm going to just pray. I don't know who this is for, but I just feel like I should pray. So I just, in the name of Jesus, whatever that is, we just ask for your healing power, Lord. We believe you for it. Da, da, da. Amen. Went on. Well, what had happened, it was, it was remarkable. Actually, two people were healed. One was a woman who, had, who was a very beautiful woman, but I had a, had, has always had a, some kind of rash on her neck, and so she always wears high collars. I never... Anyway, she got healed, but that's incidental to this, and I'm delighted she was. We had a young man in what was our nursery at the time listening over the speaker. He had been brought by a friend who was helping with child care. So he's just there for like the first time, Rattling around. What you need to know, he's from a family of gypsies. Now, his mother had been uh, on the circuit of a, of a circus in which they had a healing evangelist. And she was, she herself and other family members were paid for, at the time, $4 if they would fake a healing in his services. And so she was, to say the least, hardened to the idea of a word of knowledge and of healing, and of Christ. The whole bunch is a bunch of phonies. She'd watched phonies, and she assumed that's what it was. So her son, I didn't know, had such bad, is it psoriasis, or whatever, so that it went up his arms so, so bad that they would bleed. I mean, he was just full in his body of psoriasis. I'd never laid eyes on this young man. I never laid eyes on him. He'd come in the side door, oh, back through the nursery, we were in a high school, but it was, it was a, a room. And he'd come in with his friend, and I'd never in my life laid liars on him. And so I'm, all he's hearing is over the speaker. <coughs> By Wednesday, they were peeling. He said, they said it was so bad you couldn't even see his lips where they ended and the stuff started. You couldn't tell. They were peeling the scar tissue off or whatever in sheets. By Friday, he was, he was clear. By Sunday, I had a front row of gypsies. <laughs> I did. And when you get one gypsy, you get 20. <laughs> They're great. I love it. And so I got Pop and I got Mom. Right in the front row, looking me at, like me, like, a, what is this? Because their boy was miraculously healed in front of their eyes. And when I gave the altar call, that family, they were in ministry, by the way, today. I don't know how many of their family, I just as the years would go by, they'd always bring, this is cousin so-and-so, this is my, I mean, they got so many relatives. And they'd show up in their, you know, and they'd get saved and off they'd go. Why? Because it was, no, 
But can you, can you see the beauty of the Lord? Here's this woman hardened by phonies. And how is her son healed? By a real word of knowledge. God goes right in there and opens her heart. Hallelujah. I didn't have to argue for the existence of God. All I had to say is, Jesus died, would you receive him? Yeah. Hallelujah. When we look at the apostles, what do we see? We see people guided by the Spirit, bold in the face of persecution, functioning in the gifts of the Spirit, passionate in prayer and worship. I don't keep on reading, but if I do in chapter 4 there, you just see them. Bringing many to Christ, fully surrendered, and each one different from each other. They aren't cookie-cutter people at all. Peter and John and James and everybody's different, very different. But they're led by the Spirit. Why can we expect Jesus to do the same things today as he did 2,000 years ago? Though this letter, through this, his, this letter, the author of Hebrews has taught us. And these two things, by the way, I think are the principal points of the book of Hebrews. First of all, the priesthood of Aaron is permanently replaced by the priesthood of the Messiah. That's what that whole business about the priesthood of Melchizedek. He's talking about the Messiah's priesthood, Jesus Christ, his priesthood is supposed has now supplanted the Aaronic priesthood. The whole system of, of the Levitical priests has been supplanted by Messiah, who is now the high priest of God's people. Secondly, the covenant made at Sinai is permanently replaced by the new covenant, which is based not on the threat of our blood being shed, because that's how the old covenant was made. You splashed with the blood, so be it to you if you break your covenant, but not on our blood being shed, but on the once for all sacrifice of Messiah's blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Say that. This cup is the new covenant, said Jesus, in my blood. He knew exactly what he was saying. That's why Barnabas knows this. Because the resurrected Messiah, Jesus, constantly intercedes for us. We are never separated from God's resources. The promises of the new covenant are ours in every generation. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 8 for a moment. You've been there a number of times, but this is, this is the heart of the thing. The new covenant has replaced the covenant of Sinai. This is now the standing covenant in God's heart. And let's just see what does it promise. What are the promises of the new covenant? And just, I'm just going to say them quickly. You're looking at verse 10, chapter 8, verse 10. God, first of all, he will write his laws on our minds and write them on their, our hearts. God will open our minds to understand the word. That's revelation. He will transform our hearts so that we want to obey him. He'll take out the rebellion and he'll give us hearts that are obedient. Verse 11, he shall not teach everyone his fellow citizens and his brother saying, know the Lord. Why? Because they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. The Holy Spirit will indwell every believer. Everyone will personally, intimately, who is in the new covenant, know God. Verse 12, I love this. And I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. God will grant us mercy when we sin and keep no record of them. That's the new covenant. It has replaced the old. And the high priest of this covenant is Jesus Christ. And the blood offered is his blood on the cross. Someone say amen to that. Amen. This means we have supernatural revelation. We have a changed heart. We have a personal relationship with God we, based on his indwelling presence. And we have limitless mercy. How should we respond to the command to imitate the apostles' faith? First of all, accept the truth of verse, uh, back to chapter 13, of verses 7 and 8. Believe it. Jesus Christ is the same. Therefore, I can expect the same kind of work that the apostles did. I can imitate their faith. I can walk in the power of God. Either you believe he's the same yesterday, today, or forever, or you believe the teaching that says, these things passed away. They are no more since the apostles passed away. That, in, I'm going to tell you bluntly, 
I believe the teaching that says that the power of the Holy Spirit has been removed from the church. And what's the point of it? They say, well, those things were just sign gifts to confirm the writing of the Bible. That it was really the Bible. And now that you have the Bible, you don't need healing anymore. I never did figure the logic of it, but we have a Bible. I love the Bible. You know I love the Bible. You get it crammed on your throat week after week. Right? Now you get OD'd on the thing around here. I love this book, but it leads me to a living God. And to say that this book somehow is meant to replace the active presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of new covenant believers is heresy. It's not just bad theology. It's a doctrine of demons meant to strip the church of her power and leave us one more religion on a field of many. Arguing we're right and they're wrong because why? And that's exactly the issue at stake in America today. Are you just a bunch of bigots saying your, 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 your Jesus is the only way? Who are you to say that? Well, peel the psoriasis off your kid and say that. See the, see the cartilage come back into someone's neck. Feel the presence and power of God. Raise a man who's been crippled since he was born and he's 40 years old. Yeah, well, let's discuss it now. Let's discuss if this God is really there. He says, imitate their faith. Walk like they did. Don't say the years have passed and therefore this can't happen anymore. Jesus is interceding for you constantly. There's no sin in the way. He has poured out his Holy Spirit. The, the, the gifts of the new covenant are perpetual. For Christ, the high priest, is a, has made a once-for-all sacrifice. He intercedes constantly on your behalf. Everything God has ever given anybody is available to his people now. Receive the new, co new covenant by repentance and faith. I'm deciding whether I'm done with point one. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. Did I make myself clear? <laughs> Just want to make sure that you didn't miss anything there. They, this verse, you gotta, you're going to have to take your pick. People take, and they, they go to Corinthians 13, where it says these gifts and these things will pass away. And it does say that, and it tells you actually when. It says when the teleos, the perfect, comes. And those who are trying to say that the power of the Holy Spirit is not for today say that the, the teleos is the Bible. Now, there's not any ounce of ground to stand on. It is the most foolish, and, and any, honest, any honest student of the Bible would never say that. So you have to be dishonest to say it, or simply ignorant. It's impossible. The teleos is the arrival of the Messianic age. When Messiah comes, when Jesus returns, these things will not be there. But until then, they will. So take your pick. These things passed away. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, or forever. You have to choose. And if he is available to us today, as much as in the early church, where did it all go? Where is it? Well, that's, it's another ser sermon I can't preach right now, but to go through church history, watch the decline of the church. Watch the horrible things done by people who call themselves Christians. Watch the foolishness, the demonic foolishness of people who were leaders, quote, of the church of Jesus Christ. And it's no surprise where it went. What's wonderful and amazing is that God's still with us. God is restoring, in my opinion, in my opinion, what we see in the book of Acts is the way the Lord wants. Now, culture will change. The way things are said and done will change in some form. But the basic spirit of things that you see in the early church is how Jesus wanted it. These were the men and women right out of his training, right, had watched him, had listened to him. They were fresh from the preparation of the master and read how they functioned. And then look at how we often function and say, wow, there's a disconnect here. There is. 
my opinion, we need to do all we can do to go back and walk like they walked, to imitate the apostles, to imitate those who first led us and taught us the word of the Lord. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Praise God. All right, I got I to gotta get moving. We need to receive the new covenant. We need to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is one thing to have the Holy Spirit. It's another to yield myself to his presence and welcome him in. I want to make something real clear. One of the debates that comes along with this also is this argument that says, if I believe in Jesus Christ, I have the Holy Spirit. And then some people say, well, if you've got the Holy Spirit, why is nothing happening? And then you have over here a group that says, well, if you don't have these gifts and you aren't just, you know, speaking in tongues and stuff, you don't have the Holy Spirit, which is absolute foolishness. Both with this is incomplete and that's heresy. Now the radio is going, which, which one did he point to? Anyway, <laughs> that, the, the incomplete. The, the incomplete one is the one that says we have the Holy Spirit, but and then I said, where is, where is the act, activity? The Bible is quite clear. You are saved this way by repentance, which means you cease to be independent and rebellious. You surrender wholeheartedly and completely to Jesus as your Lord, and you know whether you have or haven't. Secondly, faith. And faith doesn't mean, yeah, I think he's a God. I think he died. I, Jesus died and rose. I think that happened. It is not that kind of faith. It's clinging faith. It's the kind that you grab the cross of Jesus and say, you died for me. Because of you, I'm forgiven. And I will trust that to the last breath in my body. That repentance and that faith not, not only save you, they give you the new covenant. And with that, you are given everything of God. Paul will say, and I give you a reference in there somewhere, in Corinthians, Paul says, if you have Christ, everything is yours. You possess all things. And he, at that point in time, he's talking about the universe. I mean, everything's yours, he says. It's, it's, hardly, it's mind-boggling what he's trying to say. You possess all things. So do you have the Holy Spirit when you repent and believe in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. You've been given everything God has without restraint. It's all been given. Amen? Amen? But to have been given the Holy Spirit and to have received and walked in all that I've been given is another thing altogether. I need to not only say, well, I've got it and argue theologically, I need to let his presence fill me and work through me. I need to be refreshed constantly. This is Charles Finney. Do you know who he is? Oh, yeah. Finney was, uh, he was born in 1792. And uh, he, the, he was, what I'm going to read to you happened in 1821. That'll help, that'll help a lot. Um, but he, he was a man who was used by God greatly in, in, in awakening of the American people and, and in saving many. But listen to his personal comments here. He says, to the honor of God alone... I will say little of my own experience in this matter. I was powerfully converted on the morning of the 10th of October. In the evening of the same day, and on the morning of the following day, I received overwhelming baptisms of the Holy Ghost that went through me, as it seemed to me, body and soul. I immediately found myself endued with such power from on high that a few words dropped here and there to individuals were the means of which, means of their immediate conversion. My words seemed to fasten like barbed arrows in the souls of men. They cut like a sword. They broke the heart like a hammer. Multitudes can attest to this. He was a great preacher. Oftentimes a word dropped without my remembering it would fasten conviction and often find myself, pardon me, often find result in almost immediate conversion. Sometimes, listen to this, I would find myself in a great measure empty of this power. I would go out and visit and find that I made no saving impression. I would exhort and pray with the same result. And I would set apart a day 
for fasting and prayer, fearing that this power had departed from me and would inquire anxiously after the reason for, of this apparent emptiness. And after humbling myself and crying out for help, the power would return upon me with all its freshness. This has been the experience of my life. We leak, we drain, we dry up, we get tired, we get grumpy. Sin builds up in us. But you and I must never be content with dryness and powerlessness. We must never allow that state. What he said is, he went before the Lord, fasted and prayed and says, I will not be content with this. Something's wrong. And he would stay before the Lord and let him refill him. I don't like sharing my own stuff, but I, I did last night in one service, so I guess I will now. <laughs> Yesterday morning, as I was preparing for the weekend, I felt very, very weary, I think the word is, just not, not in the spirit. And I've, I've had some of that, kind of, I get on and off. It's, it's been a bit of a lingering condition, actually. And I'm not aware of anything that I could put my finger on. I'm not, I am not harboring or hiding some kind of hidden sin. I'm not. But I've been dry, and I didn't know why. And I sat, and I really asked, I just called on the Lord. I just sat before him, and I called him. And I said, what is wrong? Why is my heart like this? And then he showed me. And it wasn't a pretty picture. He showed me that I had a list of, of, of men. They were all men, and I... Who, are, who, I, who I knew, who I had um, grown angry toward and judgmental of, quite frankly. And they're not in this church, so it's not you. <laughs> but it's a pretty good list. And it's not just in anyone. It, it's amazing. I mean, I didn't, I didn't see this. I did not have a clue this was there. If you'd asked me, I'd have said absolutely not with a straight face and meant it. But as we went down the line, he showed me, you're angry and you're judgmental. And then he said this, he said, of, of most of them, he said, they would like you to love them. They would like you to invest in them and care about them, but you have judged them and withdrawn your heart. And it was, it was an unpleasant picture. In fact, I was dealing with it even last night afterwards, just saying, Lord, I don't know how I got to this state. Because I found, even after, and I did, I repented. I asked him, and I blessed each one. But then there, I would find myself going back into this argument in my mind, where I'm arguing or criticizing somebody or telling them off. And I'd have to stop myself. It's a regular habit. I didn't realize. What's that mean? It dries me up spiritually. I'm going to tell you, bitterness, judgmentalism, things like that that come into our soul, dry our spirit. They lift this thing off of us. And, you, and, if, and if, it's, if the presence of the free flow of the sweetness of the Lord isn't in your life, there's a reason. And I'm not, I'm not casting guilt. Just, but today we're about to take communion. And this is a great moment to say, Lord, why? You, now let me tell you, I know the new covenant. I understand it. I know that my sins are forgiven and remembered no more. I am not under condemnation. And that's why I can be so free and open with him and say, what's going on in my heart? There's a, I, I can't sense you. I can't the way I want to. I, can't, I want to be close and I've, there's something between us. What is the deal? I don't, have to, I don't have to lie. I don't have to blame somebody. I don't have to go there. I can just say, what is it? And he showed me. And then as I address it, that sweetness comes back. Finney says, I get full of the Holy Ghost, and man, I just say a word to somebody, and <laughs> stuff's happening. But I dry up, and nothing happens. It's not us, people. It's not us. It's not you. It's not eloquence. It's not, it's not, did you say? It's the presence of the Spirit. When you and I are anointed of the Lord, when we're like Peter and John, when we're being led and moved to the Spirit, things happen that are remarkable. You could never make them happen. And when you're dry, 
no matter how bright you are, no matter how learned and studied you are in what you're about to do or say or how practiced you are, nothing seems to happen. And, and Finney says, this has been the experience of my life. Imitate the apostles. Watch their lives. For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His power and availability, his willingness to work through us, is the same as when he was with his disciples and sending them out two by two. It's the same as when we read the pages of the book of Acts. And he will be available and working with his people until he returns in his glory. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for this table that we're about to enjoy. Thank you so much for the symbols of our, our Lord's broken body and his shed blood, that we have indeed a high priest now who in a once-for-all sacrifice on the cross has washed our sin away and given us the new covenant. How grateful we are that you will write your law on our minds and heart, that we will all know you from the least to the greatest, for you will dwell inside us in power, and that our sins will be treated with mercy and you'll remember them no more. We come to this table, Lord, and we open our hearts to you in any place, anything particularly today that would keep that anointing, that presence of God from us, anything that would obstruct us from opening up and drinking deeply of your lovely presence and being refreshed. Oh, Lord, show us that. Take it out of the way. We would confess it quickly and freely. We would open up and drink of your spirit that we might be empowered by God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. May I have those come who will assist me in serving? You may go ahead and take those. When we pass the tray, it here we do not just hand it to the next person we actually serve them communion and so you hold it for the next person as they take the bread and the cup and then while they're doing that would you speak these words the body of Christ broken for you the blood of Christ shed for you let's practice the body of Christ broken for you the blood of Christ shed for you so you are ministering communion to your neighbor and then you are also speaking what I think is prophetic you're speaking the word of the Lord that their heart might hear it now, we've got some time while everybody's served. When we all receive, then we'll take together in just a few minutes. But there's some time right now to do some open-hearted conversation with the Lord. You've got the symbols. How much mercy could he possibly give you? So don't be afraid, but come boldly and say, what's in there? Anything that keeps you from moving in power and dwelling powerfully in my life. I want it out, and I want it out now. Show me, Lord, and I'll obey. Let him do some heart cleaning. And then we'll take communion in just a few minutes. And I will be merciful to them. And their sins I will remember no more. For what I received from the Lord that I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As you're ready now to put your sin, your sorrows, your sickness, all of these, these things that have just borne you down and put them on the torn shoulders of our great scapegoat and let him bear them away from you, would you take the body of Christ broken for you? Blessed be the Lord. He took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Not yours, mine. Once for all, my blood will grant you the new covenant. Lord, we believe, we receive your cup. We receive your wonderful covenant. If that's your covenant, would you take the cup of the new covenant?
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Have a wonderful week. You stand in a wonderful covenant. God bless you.